Greetings! Today on Plato's World, I'm going to do something a little different. We're going to have a brief introduction to Mark Twain's classic, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer is the story of a boy. But like any boy, he lives in a place, and that place is his world. That is indeed one of the charms of boyhood. St. Petersburg is St. Peter's Town, the holy city, Rome, the eternal city, the center of the earth, or at least the dwelling of God's anointed. It is the home of pious Aunt Polly, of Sunday school and Sunday sermons. As an American village, this holy town is also a fallen city, inhabited by the harmless drunk Muff Potter and the murderous half-breed Injun Joe. It includes serious men like Judge Thatcher, well-meaning men like the Sunday school superintendent, and serious fools like the bewigged schoolmaster. It is a place of much showing off and much aspiring, subject to revivals and enthusiasms. It is also a merry place of circuses and picnics. It is a place of mock battles and childhood sweethearts, love and war. It is a world within a world. Surrounding it is, appropriately, heaven and hell. Actually, there are two of each. One heaven is Cardiff Hill, which towers over the town, lush, green, and sunlit. It is the home of the doughty Welshman and his sons, and higher up the slope, the kind, wealthy widow, to whose heavenly abode Huck Finn is eventually transported for his bravery, and almost rebels from. The other is the pagan heaven, the Isle of the Blessed, Jackson Isle, to which Tom, Huck, and Joe Harper escape, and enjoy three days of freedom from school, parents, and even clothes. They died and went to heaven, and even had the enjoyment of hearing their own funeral service. Likewise, there are two hells or underworlds. One is the Christian graveyard, where Tom and Huck repair to cure their warts with a dead cat, and stumble upon Injun Joe's murder of the young doctor, who is there to steal a corpse and becomes a corpse himself. It is the place of wickedness. By the way, every righteous place has its place of iniquity. The graveyard is St. Petersburg. Likewise, the Temperance Inn has room number two, filled with kegs of liquor. The other underworld is McDougal's Cave, a place of natural wonders and frights, into which Tom and Becky Thatcher descend as children and emerge as adolescents, having sealed their love, at least for the moment, in the face of near death. It becomes the place of judgment and the tomb of Injun Joe. Running through this land is the river, which brings St. Petersburg commerce and circuses, but also sets it apart from the rest of the world and places it upon the frontier, in Missouri rather than Illinois. The river defines this world. As the outcome of two of Tom's main adventures, on Jackson Island and McDougal's Cave, suggest, this is a story of resurrections, of Tom's coming back to life. But unlike in the original gospel, our hero is a boy, whose father, heavenly or otherwise, makes no appearance whatsoever. A boy who manages to be resurrected twice without dying once. There is no serious weeping or rending of garments in this gospel. It is a nearly comic tale. Nearly comic since it does not end in a marriage. Tom's antics and kindness manage to wipe even Aunt Polly's tears away. It is fitting, then, that the third main adventure, the search for buried treasure, culminates in the discovery of Merle's gold hidden under the sign of the cross. This is no heavenly salvation, but a thoroughly earthly boon. Furthermore, as Hick Huck quickly realizes, a boy has little need of money. Being rich ain't what it's cracked up to be, he says. Tom, too, recognizes that in this new Jerusalem, joy comes from the seeking, not the having. It's a lesson he could have predicted from his experience conning his friends into whitewashing Aunt Polly's fence and paying him for the privilege of doing so, or from his ill-fated acquisition of the Sunday School Bible Prize. Can we say that Tom is a Jesus unburdened from being the son of God, or a Telemachus unburdened from being the son of Odysseus? Well, what we can say is that the respectable child of St. Petersburg wishes to become Robin Hood, then a pirate, and finally a noble robber. He's a natural aristocrat transported into the world of democratic bourgeois man. Still, this is a story that contains within it a stern warning from the narrator, a great and wise philosopher, if he does say so himself, a warning against edification, moralizing, and above all, ending a composition with a sermon. So rather than making pronouncements about democracy, Christianity, or America, 
Let's stick with the facts. That this is the history of a boy, a boy's adventures, his queer enterprises in the world, whose outcomes, as ventures, no one can predict. A man's history should end in marriage. A boy's has no natural end. One could say there, that, therefore, it can be held in the mind as expressing total possibility and eternal hope. But a humbler stance, and one more sincere to those of us who left boyhood behind long ago, is that the recollection of such a history simply brings us momentary pleasure. Thank you for joining this brief introduction to Mark Twain's The Adventures of Tom Sawyer.